I, I watched um, cohort one and then cohort four's uh, videos, both of theirs before I doing this and then reading it. Um, just because I was hoping that somebody would make it very clear to me and that they understood what was going on. Um, and I feel like everyone is still slightly confused. But basically, the whole point of this, all of us learning all of these horrible things was so that we could understand how tidyverse works and that we could make our own tidy style functions and that we could do cool, crazy things with ggplot and tidyverse and tidy select, yada, yada, yada. That was why we did all of this. Um, <laughs> and there is a purpose to that. Um, that is the, the, the next chapter then. So the next chapter after this one, I think is translating our code. Yeah. yeah. Which is, I think they're going to walk through HTML and mm. I can't remember the other one. Um, mm. Which this, this uh, chapter at evaluation kind of starts, starts getting us into the light of why we wanted to get this idea of quotation, quasi quotations and all of this stuff. So hopefully as we waddle through this together, um, and I'm also gonna not do the thing on base evaluate, base. I'm not doing a lot of that oh, on yeah. base. Okay, cool, um, <laughs> So we'll go through it slowly and I will be probably just as surprised as you in some points what's on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> so. Are we okay? What's this chapter about? So evaluation is this idea of us actually, you know, we, we've built these expressions and these quotations over the last two chapters and we build these quasi quotations where we quote some part and we store it for later. But now we're getting to the idea of how to actually evaluate these quoted bits of expressions in custom environments to achieve very specific goals. And we're going over what is called non-standard evaluation um, which apparently Hadley doesn't like very much, so he likes to call it tidy evaluation. And of course, we're using the Rlang package, package to do it. So base eval um, evaluates an input expression in an input environment. Um, it, it takes as an argument expression, an expression you want to evaluate. Um, and it takes an environment, what? That isn't right. Anyway, so when you use eval from Arlang, you can um, evaluate it in any specific environment. So for can example- I ask here, a question? Yeah. Are you on a slide right now? Um, uh, can no one see anything? <laughs> I can see the front, the title slide. Yeah. Is that what we're yeah. supposed to be seeing? No. <laughs> okay, yeah. it, it sounded like you were referring. Yeah, I don't think we're seeing that. Do you see anything now? No. What no. is going on? Wait, 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 okay, share screen. Let's try something different. Do I have to share this? Do we see something now? No. It says no? it started, but it looks like maybe it's loading. Okay, I'll wait. I mean, it hasn't done anything. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's so still not doing anything, which is not great. Okay, I'm gonna leave and rejoin. Sometimes that helps. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we could have gone quite far into that. It's me being like, okay. I don't know what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> okay, do you guys see a screen at all? Yes. Yeah. Okay. See my screen. Hey, yeah, we can see your screen. Slack. We can see Slack. Do you see? You see slides? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Now we can see the basics. Perfect. Okay. Cool. So, right. So we're going to use Arlang's eval, and what that allows us to do is to evaluate an expression inside of an environment. So, for example, in the global. We can make a variable called x, we can assign it to 10, and we can evaluate this expression x with the eval, and we will get 10 as expected. We can then make a, a thing called y. We can make an expression x plus y, 
And then we make a wee little environment, which has an environmental variable called x. And when we say evaluate this expression in this environment, we get 1002. Because rather than using our global x, which is 10, it is now using the x, which is inside of the environment that you told it to evaluate in. So we get 1002. Um, the first argument of eval is evaluated, not quoted. So this will not work in the way you want it to. Um, if you just say print x plus one, that will very helpfully evaluate for you um, x plus one, which because we had an x in our global environment, will print out 11. So you need to wrap it in an expression to get the uh, behavior that you're expecting from that. Do you know why it's uh, why it's printing out twice eleven? It's returning the value as well. Uh, so because it's even yeah, so it's returning x plus one and printing x plus one then. I think so. Yeah. I want to say that's what it's doing. It's evaluating x plus one and then it's printing x yeah. plus one was puzzling a, a bit. <laughs> OK. OK. There is actually an application, I guess. There is something which is a, a R function I had never heard of called local, where you can basically, the way I think of it is that it's a tiny little environment, which is going to get created once you call local and then destroyed immediately. And it's going to be really useful if you've got, for example, variables that take up a ton of RAM that you don't want to have to actively call RM on, that you just want to be transiently around, kind of like how you do, you know, when you work with a function call, you expect that environment to appear and then disappear. Like you don't think your internal variables in the function call are gonna stick around. So you can actually do something with, there's something called local, which allows you to do that same kind of idea that when you wrap something in local, um, X, y, x plus y are going to be created in this little local area. And then if you tried to call um, x and y afterwards, you wouldn't be able to get access to them. So it, it makes them very temporary. Uh, we can replicate local using eval. So we can say this is our local to function. The function is going to take an expression. It's going to create an environment, which is going to be the caller environment. So that'll be the function the environment inside of this function. And then it will evaluate the expression of this expression inside of this environment. So when we call local2, um, foo local2, x plus y, um, we will get 210. However, oops, that disappeared. If you tried to access x plus y later, you, they're not sticking around in your like, your environment pane here. Boop. Uh, that did not render correctly. So ignore that stuff. Um, <laughs> so we can also replicate source. So source is, of course, the function used to call a, another R script. Um, and what it essentially the way this one's going to work is it's going to read in a script line by line with read lines, um, collapse on n, and it's going to paste them all together. So we start with a path, an environment will be the caller environment. Um, the file is going to be pasted together read lines. So for each line in our, our script, we'll collapse it with new line. And then it will parse the expressions, which is going to be this basically big, long, concatenated series of R commands. That, 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 that. Um, and you will go along the expressions, evaluate those expressions. So inside of the environment here, which is going to be your caller environment, um, and you invisibly turn result for a reason that I don't remember. And I watched the thing saying why we should do this. I think <laughs> it's because it's, I think it's a similar thing with when we did the express 
print why it gave us 11 twice is that mm. you're something returned back so you call invisible because you don't necessarily need results actually turned back returned back because it's just going through it's kind of like we're trying to as you do with walk where you evaluate but you don't necessarily need anything given back to you um okay so exercise one uh carefully read the documentation for source what environment does it use by default what if you supply local equals true how do you provide a custom environment uh <laughs> I didn't carefully read the documentation for source, but I think we could all pretty much guess what its its global its its default environment was. Um, it's the global environment, um, and you can explicitly call. Um, you can actually explicitly set it to a current environment. So, for example, if you just wanted to source a file that was only going to be relevant inside of a function call you could tell it to call to the caller end if you set local equals to true when you're calling source so you can do that i thought mm -hmm. that was an interesting idea mm -hmm. i'm thinking i might set that up and call that in a couple of my R scripts that are calling scripts within functions for functions that are only needed temporarily um right i don't usually like to go through these kinds of ones because i think they're tedious but this one I actually thought was interesting and it wasn't that tedious. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I'm saying that is it, it helped me get this idea that eval and expression are kind of like opposites of each other. So they're going to be stripping away from each other. So for example, if we start here, expression two plus two, it's gonna just like keep this thing expression two plus two, right? It's not gonna get evaluated until we call eval and then it will get evaluated and then it will turn into an expression evaluation an expression an evaluation so actually all of this because they're kind of evenly wrapped will just boil down to four um here we have a similar thing so we have the expression two plus two evaluation of the expression expression of the evaluation evaluation of the expression expression of the evaluation um, and then we evaluate and then this the second call to evaluation here is kind of unnecessary um, and you're still just going to get four two plus two um, this one i'm not going to walk through the whole thing but basically because this final one isn't balanced what we're going to get because it ends with an expression rather than an evaluation is this long um, kind of expression <laughs> this long expression of a val express val express val express so that at least helped me kind of get this idea of like evaluation and expression are opposites of one another and they're going to kind of convert either from the expression or actually do the code inside of the expression is why i walked through this kind of bleh, bleh, bleh one um all right then finally walking through using get and assign so get and assign are two of the functions that before we have done this whole section on a metaprogramming i feel like uh, you might have used I, they're the ones i have used and they're the ones i've used when i'm trying to do something like create functions that are going to loop over like a list of variable names and assign each of something to a variable name so that's where i've used assign and then i've used get inside of like functions where i want to basically like make a ggplot for every column or a series of columns and then give it a list of a list of columns um, and then it will get. So you guys have used get and assign. Um, that's okay. We will walk through them really quickly. So if I wanted to say um, sign x 42, that won't work because I have a comp two there. Um, now I have a value here in my um, workspace, which is 42. Sign fish 42. So assign basically says you can give it a string input and it will assign, it will create a variable of that name um, with that value. Get is kind of the opposite. So if I said x equals fish, 
get x. Oh, that was a bad example. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, so x equals fish. Fish is 342. If I do get x, um, I get the value that is stored inside of x. x here is this string, which is fish. Um, does that does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the two meta program whoa meta programming things I had used, um, but I guess they can be more complicated. So uh, walking through them. So get to uh, and remember the goal of get is that we're going to give it like a string and it's going to evaluate the the variable which has the same as that string. So the way this is going to work is we're going to say function name um, environment will be caller environment. We're going to insim the name. So we're going to take this, this value here. We're going to turn it into a symbol. And then we will evaluate this name symbol in the environment that we called it from. Um, so for example, I can say x is 1, get to x. Um, will give me the value of one um, because we are basically taking this string here, x, you're turning it to a symbol and then we're evaluating it x inside of that environment, which is its value. Um, assign to, so assign is basically going to take in a string, create a new variable, um, that is the value that you give it in the second column. So again, this is gonna be name, which will be our string, the value that we want to be in, the environment that we want this all to happen. Um, so we're gonna turn it into a symbol first using insem. So we take our name value, we turn it into a symbol, and then we are going to make an expression that's going to, uh, that's going to assign it. So we're gonna do that with the expression. We're going to bang bang name sim to get the value that's inside of name sim. We're going to bang bang value to get the value that's inside of value. And then we're actually going to evaluate this expression that we created here. So the thing that's inside of here, the thing that's inside of here will be this expression and we evaluate it inside of our environment. So now if we say assign to x4, um, that will give us variable x and assign to cat six will also, which is also why we're using nsim here rather than sim. Um, might show you what will happen if we try to do this. I think your screen share stopped again. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> at what point was I just muttering and you guys were looking at nothing? Can you uh, see this? It was, I, I saw, you, no, now it's, uh... Just telling us that you've stopped screen sharing, but not uh, showing us anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hold on one second. I'm going to try something. Yeah, so I saw, I still saw the right slide, I think, but I didn't see your mouse moving or anything. <laughs> okay, I'm going to share again. Okay, do you see my screen? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Wait, okay. I will try to leave again. I'll be back. <laughs> okay, this is gonna work. You're gonna see things. It's gonna be great. Uh, no, don't do that. Okay. Okay. Do you see Slack? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant. Okay. So weird. <laughs> I don't know what's happening. I, I don't know if it's my home internet or what. Okay, so assign to. Um, actually, here we'll do this first. Nothing's in my environment right now. I make a function assign to. Um, I can give it a symbol x like this. Um, that's going to make a value in my environment now, which is four. Um, I can also make something called cat, um, cat like this. However, the reason you should use nsim rather than sim 
as it says you should do in the um, the example is that this is not going to work because it doesn't exist. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas because msim is the functional inside the function version of it. So it says use sim, we should probably use nsim to get that to work correctly. Dog, um, that's my little tangent. Um, okay, can you see a slide now? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this brings us to the idea of closure, um, which is a beautifully made up word. And a closure is basically an encapsulation of an expression. So this is a combined kind of data type, which involves, weird, um, which involves both the combination of the expression that we're interested in and the environment that we want it to be evaluated inside of. So that is a closure. Um, we can make them with n quo or n quos, um, similarly as the n sim and all these other things have their n and non m. Um, there's also quo and quos for express and express. Um, you probably shouldn't need it. And there's another function called new closure, which is useful for learning the idea of closures, but probably you won't use it either. Um, end quotes and end quotes are probably the only ones you'll actually use. Um, so we can create a closure, um, for example, like this, which is a function which will end quote its arguments. Um, function create or closure create a plus b will return us a closure type object, which will be the expression of a plus b evaluated in the environment of global because we didn't give it anything else. Um, we can do some really complicated stuff with like recursive and fall through functions. I put this in here. I'm not sure if I really want to go through it. Um, but basically we can have this function F which takes the dots, which will assign X to one. We'll then call the function G. Um, the second argument will be F equals X. Um, G will take the function, it will create the closure object, which is going to be a binding of an expression to an environment. We say x equals one, we call our function, we say global is x, and what we get is a list of multiple closures, and we get the closure of global um, here, which is going to be just the evaluation of x in the global. And then you get the closure, which is again, the binding of an expression to an environment, um, which will be F, where we're also getting X and then this environment, probably whatever the name of this would be. Um, that's kind of not the greatest example of closures uh, or what you'd wanna do with them. I'm gonna skip through this stuff. Basically they're call objects. They're built on the concept of formulas so they're subclasses of formulas. Um, you can extract them using get expression from a super closure. So you can th get the expression back out of this expression plus the environment that it's evaluated in, mosh. Um, all of this comes down to tidy evaluation. So the reason that we want to understand or use a closure or create a closure is basically so that we can use tidy evaluation and that we can do something like filter, you know, species potato um, without having to add quotes or do anything like that. So non-standard evaluation, we talked about that last week. Um, closures was that binding of the expression to the environment it's called in. And then data masks, we're gonna briefly go through um, now. Basically, the way I've been thinking about it, um, I don't know if you guys ever read like a base R learning R book um, and then saw like the with command, W-H-I-T-H. I never use this. I think it's weird and funky and I don't like the idea of binding a data to a environment in that way. But this is a bad example if no one's ever seen it besides me. Um, moving right along. So 
you I don't. Uh, if if you did move right along, then it did not move right along. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no, what side are we on? What do you see? What, uh, twenty-one. We're on 21. I was on slide 23. I've just been <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to do this like like it's um like an old-fashioned slide deck, like next slide. <laughs> what is going on? Okay, let's try this. Okay. Can you see now? No. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> <gasps> this is cursed. Okay, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> oh, God. I don't really understand why it would, but then it's yeah. fine on rejoining. This is so weird. Um, okay, we all yeah. we are all looking yeah. at Slack. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. Don't worry then. Uh, you didn't miss anything much. If Al Tidy is going to take two arguments, it's going to take a quotient, which is going to be our mashed up expression plus environment it belongs in, and it takes a data mask, which is typically a data frame. So, for the example of how to use Val Tidy, let's say we take in the Palmer Penguins data frame. Um, and I'm now going to switch over to RStudio. Let me know if you can see that. No. no, 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 that's right, because I've shared, I've shared the wrong thing. Um, whatever, don't worry about it. It's going to break <laughs> it. Palmer's, the Palmer penguins is just a data frame of um, data about penguins. It's cute. It's a fun little toy data set. So let's say we want to create a closure, which will take the mass of the, the max of the body mass of the penguin. Um, calling NA remove. So we create our closure, um, which is going to be currently bound as the expression of max. And then because we didn't give anything, it's going to give us the default caller environment as the environment that it's bound to. We can now use eval tidy as a data frame, the data frame as the data mask. So basically what this is saying is when we call eval tidy on our penguin closure with penguins, um, it's going to give us, it's going to use um, the information in penguins in order to call max body mass and a remove to. Um, so this is kind of how, what with is, if you've ever, if you haven't used it, that's fine. I, when I was learning R, I read books that used it as the example um, and I hated it. I thought it was super weird. Um, so you can, you are on the next slide, right? We see slide 25? No. No? No. <laughs> what? Oh no, the frequency is increasing. Yeah. <laughs> I know, what is going on? Okay. Jeez. Um, Jeez. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do. What is it? Do you have, a, do you have a, a small cat or a large rat? Oh. <laughs> Ow. No, 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 you're, uh... Oh. <laughs> um, I can Aww. show you my rat if this doesn't work. Um, <laughs> uh, you still can't see my screen. No. <laughs> What is going on? Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> Maybe I can share this as like a file and then we can go through it together. Mm. Um, Take a screenshot of each slide and send them one by <laughs> one in Slack when you're ready to do the reveal. <laughs> Wait, okay, I will upload this as an HTML um, and then maybe we can go through the HTML. So I just put it in the chat here. Uh, I don't know if that works. Oh no, did my internet just completely die? You're still I can there. see it. Yeah, okay. yeah, I've got, okay. I've got it. 
Okay. Maybe we can just go through the HTML together. We're on slide 25. Okay. Um, Example just, replicating I, I, with. Yes. Um, <laughs> I feel sorry for anybody in the future who watches this and is like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so how with works is basically the same idea as using the um, the data masks. So here you can see what it does is you say library penguins uh, with penguins and you can say rather than how you would canonically do it if you're using tidyverse where you use the pipe or you wrap it around, you can say apply mean body mass um, g and a remove true. Um, and you could do that versus like, for example, if you're not, not using tidyverse, what you could do is, you know, you would call, call the vector out using the dollar sign. Um, so that's how with works. Um, but we can create our own new version of with, um, with using this end quo idea. So here we have a function. I'm talking about the thing at the bottom here with two. We have a function which takes in data and an expression. Um, so we create the end closure of the expression. Um, and then eval tidy will simply evaluate your expression on the data, um, which I don't know about that. Okay, moving to slide 26. Um, we can say subset. Oh, another one is subset. Um, so subset is basically a base R function. It only, it's, it's essentially like filter, um, but you can only use one column at a time to do it. Um, so subset here, um, the way it works is it, again, will take in data, it'll take in rows, which we're going to be feed it a, um, expression. So if you look down, you can see the expression we're going to give it is species equals Adelaide. Um, and it's going to evaluate rows to be an enclosure. Um, it will then evaluate tidy rows on the data, um, and then it will essentially subset using the base R way of indexing. So row vals um, drop false. Um, row vals is going to eventually be a, it's going to be a bunch of true and falses, which is why we're going to be able to subset like this. So we can use our subset two on penguins, species equals Adelaide, um, assign it to a data frame. And with this table call, we can confirm that we've only got the Adelaide penguins pulled out and we don't have any chin strap or Gentoo penguins. Um, right, one more example. Um, I think this is the last one I would want to walk through. So this is using select. Um, so select is, I think, if you're using tidyverse, something you've used before, it will just pull out certain columns. Um, and here we're using the dots. So the fall through dot, dot, dots. Um, select two, it's going to take in data and then extra arguments, dot, dot, dot. Uh, we're going to enclose our dot, dot, dots as a variable called dots. And then to select the variables, uh, what we're going to do, if we go to the in, inside pit, we're going to say seek along data. So we're going to get all the numbers of columns in data. Um, and then we're going to set the names of that sequence of like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, whatever, to be the names of data. So now we have a named list, which we're going to get. Uh, we're going to un, we're going to set it as a list. Then what we will do in the next one with calls down is we're going to map dots um, eval tidy vars. So basically, this is just going to say for each of the um, each of the things in dots, um, which could be either one column, two column, three columns, four columns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're going to use map to call eval tidy on all of those, that list of columns, um, and then select it if it's in the vars. Uh, that will get us columns, which will be numbers that once we then use the base R subsetting of calls drop false, will return us back a data frame which has the columns that we've put into calls. Whew, that's hard to explain in words. Um, <laughs> so you can see how it works, select two penguins. We can say bill length to body mass, and we select just bill length to body mass. Um, slide 28. So data mask has two pronouns, which are dot data and dot environment. 
which you can use to um, avoid ambiguity. So that data will always refer to a to the data you've input to it, whereas dot environment will always refer to the environment. Um, this is, I think, pretty self-explanatory to some degree, but the idea being that if you had a scenario where both your environment had a, a variable called x and your data maybe had a column called x, you can use these dot dot datas or dot environments to specifically refer to that one. So in the example here with with two, we make our little data frame. Um, so we make an, a variable called x, we make a data frame which has a value called x. When you use with two, um, we can pull back either the data x, which gives us two, because that is the data's two, x, or the environment, which is one. So pretty self-explanatory. It's there. It can be useful. You can have scenarios where there will be ambiguity. Um, moving on to slide. Sorry. I did not want to do that this way because I thought it was more confusing. I'm going to see if sharing will work. I hope it will. Because I had, I think it's slightly clearer if you can see all of the functions at once. Can you see anything? Yeah. Yes. OK. So let's say we want to create a function which is going to both subset and resample our subset at the same time. So. Subset two we made um, previously, um, and it works in the same way, right? We take rows, we enclose the rows, we evaluate tidy. Um, we have a little like safety call here, and we pull back our rows. So we can define this, boop, and that works as expected. Um, oh, this is what the penguins look like. Penguins. Um, so it works like this. We can make a function resample, which will just resample a data frame. So here we take a data frame, um, data frame n, uh, it'll sample the n rows of n, replace true, and then basically give you the index here to basically resample your data frame of a given size. And we can see that we can get a sample of, oops, we can get a sample of 20 penguins. Ta-da! Um, so now let's make a new function, which does both of them at the same time. So maybe I want to do some kind of bootstrapping where I don't have quite enough Adelaide penguins. So I want to build a kind of resampled, um, data frame of more Adelaide penguins and only Adelaide penguins. So I make my function here, which will take a data frame, a condition, and the number of rows that I want to, um, subsample back up to. So we'd say DF subset two, which we made up here, um, takes the condition, and then it resamples it using this one here. So we can try to run this, and we will get an error. That doesn't work. Um, the error is slightly different than it is in the book. Um, the reason for that is that we essentially need to use inquo, and then bang, bang, because otherwise, he had a word for why this is not going to work. And I don't remember what his description of the book is for why this is not going to work. But wait, 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 wait. It's at the bottom. Sorry, this is so boring. I'm scrolling. Quoting, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's what I'm forgetting. You won't quote this argument um, if you feed it just like this. So here, this doesn't get quoted properly. So you call it in an enquoge, make it a quoture. Um, now you can get it back out using the bang bang argument. And this will work correctly. So we can subsample back up to 152 of only Adelaide. of only Adelaide penguins. Um, can everyone see still? Yeah. I've, I've now moved, okay. Let's see how long you can still screen my screen. <laughs> um, yeah, 
I'm actually going to say, let's stop there. The rest is like a bit more explaining how to use it and then not standard evaluation in base, which I'm, this is just kind of, bleh. I'm going to say we're not going to do any base evaluations. Um, basically, the whole point of this this chapter was to get us to the idea that we can use all of the stuff that we've learned for something, that something is to build our own tidyverse style functions or to build our own ggplot style functions, which are basically this idea that you can create an expression, you can create any number of complicated expression that we want, and then with evaluation and data masking and closures of the creation of the expression, which is only intimately linked with the environment that it is called from. This is how all of this stuff is useful and relevant to our lives today as developers. Um, it is one of these chapters that I'm still like, if I ever have to do this, I will almost certainly need to read these chapters yeah. all again. Yeah. But I would say this has been my favorite one of the metaprogramming so far. Um, <laughs> just because I, I was starting to see like lights at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Um, I didn't go through any of the other exercises because it was just so many examples and I feel like we don't need any more examples. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you did or either of you want to talk about one? I also didn't really go through the exercises. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was really frustrated. <laughs> But it's true, I guess, like at the moment, I don't really need it. So I I, uh, I have like a problem to really get it yeah. or grab it. Yeah. But I guess it's good that to read it and then we heard already about it. And once you really need it or use it, then you will have to go back to it. But you at least know already um, the principles and yeah the wordings and stuff. Yeah. Mm. There was a really interesting um, example as well of a sign in one of the, I think it was cohort two's video where they basically showed using, like they have to read YAMLs all the time and they have to evaluate these things inside of a YAML into these various different variables that are then called into downstream scripts. I'm like, oh, that is something I have done before. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there is light in general, but yeah, I. I we, we know it's there now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So that's, that's it for evaluation. Um, okay.